Good evening. Multiple sclerosis is a painful and frustrating disease which causes a progressive deterioration of the nervous system. Tonight, Towards 2000 looks at a controversial, but to many an apparently effective means of obtaining relief from the symptoms of MS. From the United States, we take the night ride to the stars on board an airborne observatory. From India, we look at water hyacinth, that prolifically growing weed which causes havoc to the waterways and is now being put to good use. And an anti-missile naval defence system, reputedly the best in the world, has been developed in South Australia. And technology has finally come to that hitherto untouched edifice, the Outback Dunny. They're the reports on Towards 2000 tonight. Tonight we're going to take a night ride to the stars on board the Kuiper Airborne Observatory. Basically a conventional telescope mounted on board a star lifter. We'll be flying for about six and a half hours of altitudes of about 45,000 feet. That'll put us about above 90% of the Earth's water vapor, which would typically shield ground-based astronomers from infrared radiation coming from the edges of the universe. Scientists on board the Kuiper have already peered into the mysterious birthplace of stars. They've charted quasars and black holes. The telescope, which is mounted just forward of the port wing, is that sensitive that it could detect a lighted match on our moon. I've got to go, we're already running late. To achieve these astronomical feats, a cluster of three telescopes are used. Two smaller cameras with a wider field of view and the main 91 centimetre mirror. The telescopes are housed in this recessed section open to the elements during observations. Resonance and turbulence caused by airflow is smoothed by special spoilers on the airframe. The Kuiper Airborne Observatory is probably the most expensive telescope in the world to run. Tonight's mission will cost around $50,000 and the aircraft flies about 80 missions per year. But since the aircraft began flying in 1974, scientists have competed openly for the chance of a ride to watch cosmic events they could never hope to see from the ground. But it's the thin, stable air of the troposphere that makes the Kuiper such a valuable viewing platform. Nearly every object in the cosmos gives off thermal radiation in the form of infrared rays. But clouds and water vapor diffuse and swamp them before they ever reach ground-based telescopes. Up here on the Spartan control deck, a whole generation of infrared astronomers have cut their teeth. They've made some spectacular discoveries. While flying over Australia, they sensed the rings around Uranus. They've logged the speed of stars at 600 kilometers a second. They've charted extremely powerful infrared sources in distant galaxies, generating heat at 100 billion times that of our sun. But by the time the radiation has traveled across the eons of space, it's infinitesimally weak. Still, the primary telescope is able to focus and amplify it to something measurable. Tonight's first leg will focus on the nearby Orion constellation to help calibrate the instruments. This is the receiving or focal plane of the primary telescopes and the secondary tracker telescopes. The telescope itself is behind, there, behind that bulkhead, open to the atmosphere. Outside it's about minus 50 degrees. The telescope appears to be moving, but in fact, it's the plane moving around the telescope. A very complex series of gyros and stabilizers and an air bearing is keeping it absolutely steady, steady on the Orion constellation. Out of this fiber optic cluster comes the faint heat registration of what could be the birth cry of a galaxy. The signal goes down into helium canisters that are at minus 273 degrees, almost absolute zero. And that shields the faint infrared radiation from being masked by the radiation that's occurring here on the flight deck. The telescope remains accurate to within fractions of one degree, only marginally less than a ground-based installation. 
but even with that precision, it's sometimes quite difficult to first find the target star and then lock on the inertial guidance system. Okay, you on track? Yeah. Okay, bring it in. Good. Okay. Up, no, up a no, little no, bit. No, the bar side's good, isn't it? Okay. So go back, tweak back, see a little more. Okay, right there. No. It's an awfully big galaxy out there, and tonight's mission, or at least one of the mission legs, is to, to hone in on a small guide star in the middle of the Orion constellation. Now, that's something like two billion light years away. And since the primary telescope only has a one degree field of vision, they have to use two smaller telescopes, an acquisition and a tracking telescope, to first get the area of the sky and then hone in on it with the acquisition camera. Now, once the acquisition camera is locked on, the, com the computer updates information on the star's position to the autopilot of the aircraft. So once it's locked on, the telescope is virtually flying the aircraft. As the star lifter roars on, the galactic video game continues. And then the target star looms like a ball on the video monitor. The inertial guidance system is engaged and banks of computers start logging data on the thermal profile of the star. The astronomers will later be able to interpret the data to detect hydrogen, sulfuric acid and carbon, some of the chemical building blocks of the universe. The Kuiper's flights will take the astronomers around the world in the next few years in search of mysterious and violent cosmic events. The birth of supernova, the reign of red giants and white dwarfs and each flight will tell them more about where we came from and perhaps where we will go in the future. Most people recall the dramatic sinking of the British warship HMS Sheffield during the Falklands War. A single French-made Exocet missile fired from an Argentine aircraft beyond the horizon resulted in the total loss of the ship and a number of lives. Trying to defend ships like that against such fast, low-flying missiles has proved something of a nightmare for defence planners. But now, Australian scientists have come up with a dramatic solution to the problem. It's called Hover Rock. Rocket propulsion and electronic warfare experts at the Weapons Systems Research Laboratories at Salisbury in South Australia, who developed the Hover Rock concept, describe it as an extraordinary breakthrough in weapons technology which could protect Australian and Allied warships against missiles like the Exocet. The huge Defence Research Centre at Salisbury occupies over a thousand buildings in some 1,300 hectares of land. It employs over 450 scientists in a total workforce of around 2,500. Well, this is one of the buildings in which the research and development for the rocket took place. It's lined on both sides by various types of laboratories. And unlike other defence research establishments in different parts of the world, it combines a number of different disciplines under one roof. For example, oceanography, aerodynamics, um, rocket propulsion and uh, electronic warfare. And that's good because the hover rock concept required very close cooperation between the electronics warfare people and the rocket propulsion scientists. The basic idea behind the project was to defend naval ships from attacking missiles by electronic trickery. The moment an incoming missile was detected on radar, a decoy of some sort would be launched. Various devices were considered including a remotely piloted helicopter-type craft which would distance itself from the ship, hover, and then send out streams of electronic signals, electricery they call it, to try to deceive the attacking missile into thinking of the hovering craft as a more attractive target than the ship. The difficulty was getting something that was relatively cheap and expendable, obviously not a helicopter, that could be in position in seconds. A rocket would be ideal, but getting it to hover was something else. Achieving that was a real breakthrough. It had never been done before with a rocket of this type. The program, which cost only three and a half million dollars, was called Project Winnin. Winnin is the Aboriginal word for to deceive. 
and the maneuvers the hover rock is capable of in carrying out its deception are quite remarkable. Not only can it be launched within seconds and then hover at a given height, but it can maneuver laterally at roughly the same speed as a ship. This is essential because modern attacking missiles can distinguish between decoys that move too fast, like most rockets, or too slow, from the real target, the ship. The propulsion system on the hover rock has been able to achieve this. Quite a feat when you consider that as a rocket burns through its fuel, it becomes lighter and lighter, and therefore should tend to keep climbing until the fuel runs out. The tests of the hover rock have been so successful that defence scientists believe that the Australian system is superior to any overseas anti-missile counter system developed so far. Well, this is the only damage that was done uh, to the rocket during that test. It's the actual whole rocket that was used. Only a small dent in the outer casing. The electronic circuitry and uh, components inside weren't damaged at all. Let's just have a look at them. Well, this is the electronic heart of the rocket. It's the command and guidance system, this green section from here to here. It's basically an autopilot that keeps the controls the hovering position of the rocket in the air. And that was designed and built at the government aircraft factory in Victoria. Down here is the uh, rocket propulsion system. And uh, that was designed and developed here at the Weapons Systems Research Laboratory in Salisbury. And that's basically a nitrocellulose solid fueled rocket that provides sufficient thrust to lift the 100 kilograms of weight of the rocket into the air and keep it flying. And down here, the real key to the rocket success, uh, these little control units, there's four of them around the base of the rocket. And what they do is, acting under directions from the autopilot, is to insert little control tabs into the rocket's exhaust, which affect the force and also the direction of the thrust, and therefore control the hovering motion of the, of the rocket in the air, and also its lateral movement through the air. A bit like the way you can balance a broom handle by moving your hand underneath it like that. But getting the rocket to hover and move sideways is really only half of it. How do you make a rocket look like a ship to an incoming missile? Well, actually, it's not the rocket it's itself that looks like the ship. It, it's the payload electronics that the rocket carries right, that right. does the job. And the, the, elec the electronics basically comprises just a simple a pair of antennas and an amplifier. The, the, ante the purpose of the antennas is to detect the pulse coming in from the homing device of the missile. The amplifier amplifies it, the other antenna retransmits the pulse at a higher level than the skin bounce from the ship. So, in other words, the, electro the purpose of the electronics is to make the decoy look like a ship only more so. The next phase is to develop the electricery, the complex electronic devices that will fool an incoming missile into thinking that this is a more attractive target than a ship. Well, that research work is already underway here at Salisbury. And if it's as successful as the program has been so far, it could be a world beater that'll save hundreds of lives and perhaps multi-million dollar warships. <laughs> Multiple sclerosis is a crippling, incurable disease that afflicts both young and old. Its cause unknown. This is a story about a form of treatment being used in Ipswich, England, and in many other parts of the world, including Australia. But first, a word of warning. We're not endorsing this form of treatment. Indeed, many members of the medical profession are opposed to it. But a growing number of doctors and sufferers of multiple sclerosis believe that it works and the advice by doctors to some of their patients has been that if it feels good and helps alleviate the pain then use it there are about a hundred thousand multiple sclerosis sufferers in britain for many conventional medicine has offered little to reverse the progress of sclerosis They've come to this research centre seeking an alternative. Yeah, I don't really add that in case I get to do it. 
But what is MS, this disease that causes such pain and contorts once healthy bodies? Put simply, it's an attack on the central nervous system. For unknown reasons, myelin, that protective coating around our nerve fibers, begins to scar and decay. That decay distorts the electrical signals between the brain and the muscular movement controlled by our nerves. The messages for movement get confused, and that includes messages controlling speech, sight, and the movement of limbs and internal organs. Incontinence and impotence are common effects. But for some victims of MS, this pressure chamber, similar to one used to cure deep sea divers from the bends, has brought relief. The divers are given oxygen under pressure, allowing them to breathe oxygen at higher concentrations than is possible at atmospheric pressure. MS patients are similarly treated. Exactly why the treatment helps is not known because the cause of multiple sclerosis is also a mystery. Dorothy Richbell's husband has been receiving the hyperbaric oxygen treatment. We had got to the stage in our relationship where I thought that all was lost. I was 50 years old a fortnight ago and um, I felt life was over, but this last week has been absolutely marvelous. We're on another honeymoon. Really? It's yes. your second honeymoon, is yes, it? Yes, it is. I told the man in the hotel this morning that that's what we were using his hotel for. He was highly delighted. And do you... Are you convinced that it is the pressure chamber that's... Oh, uh, yes, ...stopped definitely. your husband from yes. being impotent? Definitely, yes, because he hasn't made love to me now for all two, two and a half years. And this week it's been uh, quite a revelation. I've never known anything quite like it. In fact, I think it's better now than when we were younger. The treatment initially consists of four sessions of breathing pure oxygen for 90 minutes at 1.5 atmospheres absolute on four consecutive days. A further 16 sessions at two atmospheres pressure or equivalent to an underwater depth of 10 meters follows. Are you staying down here with us then? I'll stay in here with you, yes. Will you? Yes. All right. Go on then. Okay. Fifteen of these chambers are now being used around Britain. They're tailor-made to suit the needs of MS patients, built by a company known as Medilock, previously experienced in the diving industry. OK, everybody comfortable? Can you hear me? Off we go. Pressure in the chamber is remotely controlled by an experienced operator. Once inside, the patients wearing their oxygen masks simply breathe normally. Well, we've been in the chamber now for about an hour and the pressure has dropped down equivalent to about one and a half atmospheres. The feelings are really quite comfortable uh, apart from a bit of ear popping similar to that you'd feel when flying in an aircraft and some people have reported feeling a little nauseous and the odd headache can also occur but for multiple sclerosis victims the benefits far outweigh those minor discomforts. Oh, do. 90 minutes later, the treatment is over. For those who will feel any improvement, it's almost instantaneous. But because of the peculiarity of MS, where symptoms come and go for no obvious medical reason, the long-term benefits are difficult to evaluate. In the short term, for women like Sheila Prothero, who's had multiple sclerosis for 10 years, the chambers have provided a very faint glimmer of hope. What sort of difference has it made? Oh, I've made me hands, me waters, me eyes, me speech. You've got feeling From there movement. to there, yeah. Really? Yeah, I've got feeling after four years. I've got feeling. And how many days have you been going into the chamber? Eight I've been going. So that's a total of eight hours. Eight treatments. It's an hour 
get down to the pressure and then I'll sit in there an hour. And you've got all that movement? Yes, you look. Can, can you feel uh, my hand? Yes, yes. And for four years you couldn't no, feel it? No, I couldn't feel it, no. So that's how it was. Or worse than that. Mm. Okay. So it's going to come up at 4.27 to see your friends. Right, thank you. <laughs> I've just bought two pieces of paper from a stationery store in downtown Hyderabad. One cost me five rupees, the other eight rupees. That's 50 cents and 80 cents. The cheaper one was made from a resource that is fast disappearing here in India, and that's the forest. But this one, the more expensive one, was made from a noxious weed which grows prolifically right throughout the agricultural world. Scientists in India hope that the Indian public will choose to buy the more expensive one for their own ecology. The noxious weed that could help save the forests is the water hyacinth, a ferociously prolific aquatic plant that clogs waterways wherever it gets a foothold. It's extremely hardy, thriving in water laced with heavy metals and other industrial pollutants. And in clean water, it scavenges nutrients, eventually starving out all other forms of life. It propagates at an alarming rate, doubling in size in 90 days. The plant does have some advantages though. It sucks up heavy metals like cadmium, zinc and mercury like a sponge. And 42% of its bulk is made up of the stem, which contains cellulose. It was the cellulose that attracted Indian scientists' attention. Two years ago, they began harvesting this lake to utilise the cellulose for paper. Harvesting is simple. Drag the hyacinth out and leave it to dry for two days. This is the first stage of getting paper from water hyacinth. As you can see, it's a fairly labour intensive job, but then that's the way the Indians like it. They prefer employment to efficiency. The first job they do is to remove the cellulose bearing stem from the roots and the leaves. And then the stem is taken into the treatment process plant where it's boiled with caustic soda into a slurry. This rather unsavoury looking concoction is the hyacinth after it's been boiled for two to three hours. The slurry is then washed as it comes from the digester to remove traces of the caustic soda. It's now also feasible to use the water hyacinth to produce methane by treatment with anaerobic bacteria. The methane could then power the boilers and crushers for the paper plant. The plan is to have simple treatment plants like these dotted around India where water hyacinth infestation is highest. The potential is that from 400 million hectares of waterways clogged by the plant, 200 million tonnes of cellulose could be available for paper making. The only problem is the nature of the fibre tends to resist rapid mechanised pressing, so it's unlikely ever to achieve price parity with wood paper pulp. Despite the finished paper having a thick parchment-like quality, the price difference puts a question mark over the viability of the project. Scientists at Hyderabad's Regional Research Laboratory in southern central India have also been experimenting with biocontrol agents. One scientist, Dr Kaiser Jamil, has been cooperating with the CSIRO in Australia to isolate bugs and weevils that might attack the weed. The exhaustive search is finally paying off. It's quite extensive, isn't it? Quite extensive. Obviously, it would be nice if all Indians followed their Prime Minister, Indira Gandhi's lead, and used water hyacinth's paper as their personal stationery. And the curse of water hyacinth would be over very quickly. But scientists working here can't rely on commercial culling, so they've sought biological controls. Water hyacinth has no natural enemies until now. After a year of quarantine and screening for specificity, scientists in India and Australia have isolated one Venezuelan weevil that finds the water hyacinth quite delicious. They're called Nechatina Aichoni, and although the water hyacinth can withstand heavy metals, just two of these weevils can apparently lay waste to a water hyacinth leaves then they move down the stem and they finally pupate in the roots 
to emerge as adults with very healthy appetites. And scientists have done fairly exhaustive testing to find that the Venezuelan bug only wants to eat the water hyacinths. So it appears that the water hyacinths' days are numbered. The Indian government have tried to approach the problems of the water hyacinths tangentially. They've tried to utilise something which is cheap and in abundance. They've tried to build up a rural infrastructure and they've tried to control without using pesticides. And now the scientists have come up with one further option for the blue devil, and that is as a commercial flower crop. They may not be gladdies, but they certainly do have their own appeal. Well, it had to happen before too long. Advances in toilet technology have become just too great to ignore. Seriously though, the problems of uh, human waste disposal, particularly in remote areas where sewerage isn't available, have always been quite considerable. Septic tanks, yes, but uh, for one thing, they require water. But now, what we're going to look at is something that's a completely closed system, that requires no flushing, very little maintenance, and produces as an end result in a few years' time, a virtually dry, odourless and completely safe garden compost. It's a Swedish invention called Clivus Multrum, which has achieved widespread acceptance in the United States, where it's being used on the one hand to provide very low maintenance public toilet facilities in remote or inaccessible areas, but also finding acceptance as a normal household toilet. It works on one of the oldest principles in nature, simple organic decomposition. Some um, 90% of human waste is water, and by pushing a constant flow of air through the waste, that 90% is oxygenated, decomposed, and evaporated up this vent pipe. Now, the airflow through that pipe is powered on a 24-hour basis by a battery, which is in turn charged by solar cells on the roof during the day. You can probably see the whole operation a bit more clearly in this illustration. The waste is collected here, and the airflow coming in here is circulated through the decomposing organic material and up the vent, taking all odours with it. Even when the toilet seat is raised, air will flow down into the chamber, preventing any odours from reaching the room above. The slowly composting residue gradually settles and eventually can be removed here, which corresponds to this access port here. In a normal-sized household, it would take two to three years before compost would reach the storage area here. And when it does, there's an average of only a twentieth of a cubic metre. That's about a bucketful of compost per person per year that's to be removed. And that end product, as I said, is biologically safe and odourless, just like garden soil. Now, a unit of this size could handle the regular toilet use of some one to fifteen people on a year-round basis. And that would include things like toilet paper, even kitchen waste like bones and eggshells and uh, grease and fat and so on. It's going to sell for around $2,000, but perhaps the most important thing from an Australian viewpoint is that a unit like this could save something like 100,000 litres, that's about 20,000 gallons of water a year. Over recent weeks, our viewing audience has grown by many millions, as Towards 2000 is now seen each week in China. Imagine the impact of that last story there. Next, on Towards 2000, a major breakthrough in eye medicine, a laser which scans the retina to produce high-resolution pictures, enabling the most accurate diagnostic treatment. From Japan, good news for those who can't get away from the office. You take the lot with you in this fully equipped communication wagon. And one of the most advanced computer chip design centers in the world. No, it's not in Japan or in California. It's in Adelaide. And I'm going to try my hand at some fishing gear that can only be described as bizarre. Until next week then, good night.
Coming up next on ABC Television, Travellers in Time takes us into the Amazon.